Nick Corsino. You will talk to us today about subdivision surfaces, right? Surfaces. Yep. Up to you. Um, all right. So um, what I want to talk about today um, is a whirlwind tour of the history of subdivision surfaces um, and particularly how they've appeared in real-time applications over the years. I've also got a little segue into how open subdiv fits into uh, that whole entire timeline. And um, my coworker, David Yu, who um, is a maintainer of open subdiv is also on the call. Um, so maybe he can help with answering questions and things and discussion afterwards if, if people have questions or thoughts. So I wanted to start by just giving a, a little bit of a context about what it is that we're looking at here um, in terms of what subdivision surfaces are like just in a, a very, very basic sort of view. So here is a cube that I've added a couple of extra um, subdivisions into already in Blender. And I've added a subdivision Catmull Clark modifier to the cube. And as you probably anticipate, we can get various levels of subdivision going just by uh, moving the slider back and forth. So we start with a cage. And the cage has control points. And the thing that I just want to point out for context is that beyond just subdividing, you need to be able to control how the subdividing proceeds in terms of where sharp edges are and so on and so forth. And um, this is probably the main difference between like what a subdivision surface does and other modifiers like um, edge smoothing or surface smoothing that you might be familiar with operate. The um, you have fine control. So let me just uh, drive up the subdivision again. And if I grab this vertex here, which I have marked as a creased vertex, um, and I pull it out, you can see, uh, let me get a little more smoothing on there, that as we subdivide, um, there's a little bit of an influence of a crease that's going around the edge. On this side of the cube, I've marked, I've marked uh, switch to edge select this edge as a crease edge. And if I pull it out, you can see the, the shape is different because it's influenced all the way across the bottom of this object. Um, whereas the influence here is more localized and doesn't extend to the edges of the, of the edge that I pulled. So, in a nutshell, that kind of tells you a lot of what's interest. This shape uh, became that um, extended lozenge, and we'll revisit the extended lozenge and why that's an interesting shape at uh, the end of my slide deck. So here is my slide deck, and if I hit play, um, you've got my presenter view because I don't know how to run Keynote. So you are just going to have to enjoy the extra keynote furniture because I don't want to mess with learning how to run a presentation while you're all watching. All right. So there is text. <laughs> so this is uh, kind of where we start. Um, we start with Catmull Clark surfaces um, in 1978 with this paper, recursively generated bleached line surfaces and arbitrary topological meshes. Now, there are a number of subdivision surface schemes um, that predate and postdate this one, like you might have heard of DuSabin and other formulations. But the thing that's kind of unique about Catmull Clark compared to other formulations like DuSabin is that there is a limit surface uh, that is predictable from the surface mesh uh, analytically right from the start. So we have like this scheme for subdividing, like this arbitrary shape here. In the first step of Catmull Clark subdivision, everything becomes quads. Um, and then after it all becomes quads, then we just progressively refine. Um, there's a surface where we know what the ultimate continuity is um, as you recurse to the limit and it's stable. Um, 
in the case of something like do seven, as you recurse, you don't necessarily get to a limit surface with continuity. And what that means is this is effectively a, a pinchless subdivision, um, whereas other schemes that have fallen to the wayside tend not to have that, that guarantee that your surface will actually be smooth at the, at the end of the work. Now, Catmull Clark subdivision surfaces are fundamentally based on quads, as you can see there. So here, um, we can skip ahead nearly 10 years um, to smooth subdivision surfaces based on triangles by Charles Loop. And Charles Loop developed a set of, of weights and subdividing patterns and that are analogous to Catmull Clark weights and patterns, um, except that they apply to triangles. And so um, it also has the characteristic that it's got a known continuity at the limit surface, which makes it special. So between Catmull Clark and Loop, you've got solutions for triangle based meshes and you have solutions for quad based meshes. There's also solutions uh, that combine Catmull Clark with Loop so that if you have combination meshes with quads and triangles, you uh, can adaptively use either one as appropriate during that subdivision. I'm not aware though that uh, that's commonly used outside of outside of academic papers. So if you just have a look at those papers, um, you can see that fundamentally they're very, very similar. And um, on the left, we have some uh, masks for and weights for how to compute where the vertices are in a Catmull Clark subdivision. And you can see the equivalent thing um, that Mr. Loop did for triangle surfaces on the right. Like this is not the complete set of stencils and whatever, but just to get a flavor of it, they're they're fundamentally related and they um, they coexist in the subdivision surface universe as uh, very useful solutions, depending on and the nature of the kinds of meshes that you want to be dealing with. So a big milestone in subdivision surfaces um, was this paper that uh, Pixar published back in 1998, Subdivision Surfaces and Character Animation. And it shows a whole bunch of interesting things like um, how do you get post characters into these shapes and what are uh, the rules involved in just getting a nice, a nice surface. So this is really a milestone uh, where subdivision surfaces started uh, gathering attention. Now, around about the same time, and there's this paper here um, by Yas Stam called Exact Evaluation of CC Subdivision Surfaces at Arbitrary Parameter Values. And <laughs> it has little code snippets, and I've just um, plopped one of the little code snippets there. I've uh, omitted the, the spline evaluator, which is just very similar to a, a Bezier spline evaluator. But that's evaluate the surface at a point, and it's it's very straightforward and simple. And you can see um, I've plopped in the abstract there because I just wanted to talk about and um, this perception overall that folks tend to have that subdivision surfaces are hard, and um, in some sense they are hard. There's there's a lot of math, and it's dense walls of equations when you look at these papers, but it's it's really not that bad. And Yas says, in this paper, we disprove the belief widespread within the computer graphics community that Catmull Clark subdivision surfaces cannot be evaluated directly without explicitly subdividing. Now, that's a really important point because if we just go back to Blender for a second um, and we, we look at this, this uh, weird little space shuttle thing that I made here, um, the thing that you would want to do if you wanted to display this thing in real time and to some level of approximation, like let's say um, it's like really far away and we can barely see it. Like right now, it just looks like a little faceted, a little faceted blob. And um, if I increase the subdivision, it gets the shape. But the important thing is, is that the smaller it gets and the less important the shape is, yeah, the shading is critically important. Like we can see this little this little almond down here, but the shading is what gives away that that's a smooth object versus 
and that's a faceted object. So um, with that in mind, let's just skip ahead a couple of years and to 2001 and where we've got curved point normal triangles. Now, this here is saying, guess what? We can get a pretty good approximation to what we're trying to get in terms of a smooth surface um, by playing tricks with the surface normals. So an early attempt to get the feel of a subdivision surface without actually doing the work of the subdivision was to say, well, what if um, when we're evaluating triangles, we take the authored local normals, um, and this is something that I think you're all familiar with from GLTF, this notion of authoring normals to control the lighting. Um, they said, what if you take these, these authored normals, and when you're shading across the surface, you provide an interpolation, and this paper says what they think the interpolation should be um, in order to get a, a polygonal shape that has the impression of something that looks pretty good. Now, and there's this paper is pretty fun. There's a lot of interesting math in it, and it led to a lot of interesting experimentation um, for ways to get this stuff working in real time um, before we had compute shaders and all that sort of thing that makes it practical for real time. Um, so here's a scheme um, from 2003 that um, we called nine to one. And if you kind of um, don't painstakingly, but just imagine that for each one of these quads here, there's uh, nine appearing in the final surface. So this particular attempt um, worked on things like GameCube and uh, PlayStation 2 and so on and so forth, um, where the idea was, was to have a mesh of a certain allowable resolution ready for the game. And on demand, you could amplify the geometry with his nine to one scheme. And um, so here's like a, a close up of Django Fett and we can see that all the curves on him are, you'll have to believe me that they're smoother than this wireframe, but they're smoother than this wireframe. Um, and the elements in the game, like round spaceships and barrels and things um, were typically authored very coarsely and amplified in the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube hardware into into smooth surfaces, just through geometry application to one level of subdivision in general. And the trick there was to take the math from this paper and take the authored normals um, in order to deduce where the creases are. Creases are kind of the magical component um, that you need to have in order for subdivision surfaces to be useful in cases like this. Because if this was a film pipeline, we might say, well, you don't need creases at all. Let's just add lots of extra parameters or extra edge loops and things to control the surfaces and have beautiful bevels. Um, but in fact, the point here is that you need this thing to compress down into very little memory and you want to amplify it on the fly. So simply increasing the resolution of the surface in order to get that control of the edges um, isn't really an option in these cases because there would be too much geometry. So this takes advantage of something um, that's similar to what you've got like in FBX with smoothing groups. Smoothing groups have got have got continuity boundaries between them. Here, the continuity boundaries are indicated by the authored disjunct normals on the edge. And so the subdivision is guided on the fly by noticing that there's not shared normals across this edge. And so this divides is flat and this divides is round and it doesn't bubble out. A uh, scheme like this um, doesn't have the excellent property that I mentioned earlier that the Catmull Clark and loop schemes have, which is to have a guaranteed known limit surface with guaranteed analytically determinable continuity and smoothness. But um, that said, you can get a really long way without subdividing or with coarse subdivision if you know where your normals should be in order to support the lighting situation so that the shapes read properly. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to 2009, where we've got Gregory patches. 
Gregory patches, I think, are currently um, still the commonly sexy way to get subdivision surfaces into game engines. Um, <clears throat> and I assume that they're probably used in some DCCs, but I don't know. Um, the trick with a Gregory patch, um, and uh, we get to see our friend Mr. Loop here again. Uh, he's been involved for decades now with this kind of work. Um, is that you do a pre-pass on your subdivision surface. This is a Catmull Clark authored model here. You do a pre-pass where you pull out roughly 20 coefficients for each patch that describe the surface and its continuity. And then you render the patches individually and without subdividing by evaluating the limit of well, the evaluating the surface, not the limit of the Gregory patch as an approximation. And here they're showing that the schemes that they came up with works well with uh, displacement maps. All right, um, skipping ahead a few years more, we get to open subdiv, which uh, came out in 2012, or at least that's the date on the first commit. And um, I just wanna call your attention to possibly one of the best first commit messages on any open source library that I've come across so far. Um, Matt, uh, let's see, it was Manuel, Manuel Kramer here and declared open subdiv to be a kick-ass subdiv library. <laughs> Way to go, Manuel. I love it. <laughs> um, now, open subdiv goes far beyond um, the approximations that I've just talked about um, and the early approximations and tricks that we've used historically to get the appearance of Catmull Clark's subdivided surfaces into real time. And what we get with open subdiv is first of all, in 2012, and there was a paper about feature adaptive subdivision. Feature adaptive subdivision is the point where a library like open subdiv starts to become really interesting compared to um, sneaky hacks, um, as we've been looking at over the past decade of development there. Because if we have this shape like Lately McQueen here, and we're gonna use a uniform subdivision scheme, in order to get the resolution that we need, um, you know, in interesting places like the corners of um, the radiator mouth here, uh, you would need to subdivide quite a lot. And so the amplification of the geometry uh, could become in some sense excessive. Um, what feature adaptive subdivision says is we've got some rules here and these kinds of split rules are the same sorts of things that you use in level of detail for terrains and clip maps. So if you're familiar with like terrain level of detail and geometry amplification, this should be familiar. Um, feature adaptive subdivision says, hey, let's stop to subdividing when the lighting condition on the smooth regions is sufficiently described and that the shape is gonna look the same if we did like an AB error metric diff between the two images of full subdivision versus adaptive. And it says, just put the detail where it's required at extraordinary vertices. Like here you can see, we've got a five pointed patch um, or here where there's like an area of very high curvature. And you can also adapt on other metrics like um, screen space, solid angle coverage of, uh, of a bit of geometry um, and that sort of thing. And so this is part of what is, I would say, hard about uh, subdivision surfaces. It's when you're trying to get into this realm of efficiency. And that's where open subdiv really helps a ton. Here's another little bit um, that is along those same, that same axis of um, reducing the amount of generated geometry that you need in order to um, describe a surface. We've got semi-smooth creases. And what the coloring here says is uh, the level of refinement that was required um, on each surface in order to hit a certain um, visual metric. And you can see like red being um, the least refinement um, and I suppose being blue being the most possibly, and um, that with this particular feature, um, suddenly we've got a lot less amplification of geometry for an equivalent visual result. 
And in 2013, um, there was a paper about displacement mapping. Um, and here is one of Bay Rates, I think it's Bay Rates, um, like famous demonstration subdivision models with a displacement map applied upon it. And so the math at that point is fully worked. And so um, finally, just want to get ahead to 2014 and come back to that funny little lasange shape that I showed you. Um, and so this is Spotlight Stories. It was a project called Windy Day from 2014. And it was a launch project for the Motorola X, um, Motorola X smartphone. And it had um, a Google Cardboard um, 3D aspect to it. Um, so this was a smartphone with a pretty high-end GPU for the time. Um, I think the GPU in my watch is probably 100 times more powerful um, than the Moto X. But this little short here uh, was rendered in real time using Open Subdiv. And it was a version of Open Subdiv uh, that was modified. Um, it was modified by Digital Fish in order to get some pre-computation to get some coefficients onto the GPU and that were specific for accelerating it to that GPU. Um, this, is a, this is a short that's many minutes long and it's very expressive. Um, it's very, very animated. And the trick here is that open subdiv was used as an amplifier and I showed you the little Lausanne shape in Blender earlier that's like very, very primitive. And you can see how this mouse is composed of those kinds of shapes as is his friend, the squirrel there and the hat and everything else. And the really beautiful thing that they were able to do by having such a sparse geometrical representation and the amplification was they spent all their memory and CPU cycles on posing the subdivision surfaces. And so, um, it's fully fledged animation that fits into a smartphone of the era and for a duration of many, many minutes. And I think this was just sort of an amazing magic trick and um, that they pulled off with, with the technology and careful consideration of where it's appropriate. And uh, I think it's just a beautiful showcase. And the fact is this is actually open subdiv um, running on very early GPU hardware. Um, and that is that is my introduction. Um, I've skipped a whole decade of development because I felt like this point where open subdiv comes to the table and we're able to move past uniform amplification to smart amplification and is really the, the significant key thought here about where subdivision might bump up against GLTF and in terms of USD GLTF interop and this formulation and the edge tweaking in the vertex crease that I showed you in Blender a minute ago. And those are like key points where I think we can find some alignment uh, between what GLTF and USD do. USD obviously has this already. Um, and I'm hoping to dispel some thought of this being like too complex, heavy, or difficult um, for application on the web. Yeah. So that is that is my presentation. Thank you, Nick. Very very thoughtful and uh, and detailed. Thank you. C can you speak a little bit to the adoption of G of um, of Open I know it's high, very very much adopted in DCC tools. But to your knowledge, uh, are there any runtime platforms that have adopted it? Yes. Um, so <laughs> this guy and this guy, and whenever you see, whenever you see a, a real-time shape in something like an award or an emoji, um, mm -hmm. even on the watch, those are those are USD files rendered via Open Subdiv in real time. So I would say some, you know, double digit percentage of the people in the world have open subdiv and USD and on their person at all times. <laughs> this is great. 
Um, are there, do we know, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure if Epic has a impl working implementation or shipping implementation of, of OpenSubdiv in the engine, probably not. Um, Flavien Picon, can I put you on the spot? Sorry, what? Is, is there any support for OpenSubdiv in the, in the world of Epic? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. To be honest, it's not my. Let's call them yeah, for sorry. a go. I think we would know. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, okay. Any, it, it any was really like in terms, of, in, in terms of integration into game engines, um, the typical path is um, there's two paths you can take. Um, you can take sort of a caching approach where you say, I'm not going to be doing GPU subdivision. And, and so I'm going to do like what Windy Day did. I'm going to get very low resolution things. I'm going to amplify them. Um, and then I'm going to have baked vertex buffers that hang around forever. Um, but don't necessarily call um, open subdiv on the fly, except for when there's a topology change. That's one approach. Another approach is to say, hey, there's a CPU or a GPU integration. And so I'm going to defer to a compute shader to do the work. And to my knowledge, like game engines tend to bias towards and you know, the pre-computation at the moment. Yeah. Uh, we have a geometry tool to edit meshes in the engine that might be using some of the open sub div functions, but that's all I see. Yeah. We have a few people from Kronos or the world of uh, GLTF. Would that be a big breach of, uh, of the way you guys do things if we you add to your specification or presentation that requires some specific code, you know, uh, to to be decoded. Neil or Ed? Can you explain that a little bit, please? Uh, code to be decoded. Well, the the represent. I mean, opens the. You could standardize the representation of a of a subdivision surface, but you would need to run open subdiv at runtime to actually generate. Got that. So as long as it runs, as it can be made uh, to run real time in a browser, there's no particular prohibitions against that because we do things with KTX that require WebP. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Web Assembly code. And as far as that it, goes, it doesn't have to be uh, open subdiv, right? I mean. You could use uh, some different way to do uh, some different code to do Campbell Clark subdivision or loop subdivision. And even if it was adopted in GLTF, it could be a subset of the full functionality that's in um, open subdiv. So it wouldn't necessarily be linked to that library. Understood. Yeah. The, the format is extremely, extremely precise. And the mathematics are well developed and well known. Um, so building something with a conformant final surface, um, everybody should be able to exp should be able to do that however they like. Um, yeah, just build, building on those comments, this is David from Pixar. Um, yeah, the, the fundamental um, representation is is just based on uh, you know arbitrary mesh topology. So you don't really even need to extend your your representation in the format much other than to indicate which surfaces should be subdivided, um, but then as Nick mentioned, there are additional um, concerns. You know, if you want to make sure that you're dealing wanting to support or deal with um, edge and corner creasing or um, you know different um, more fine control over UV interpolation, so that's um, one aspect of just. For, for consideration for, for the group about what this, how this might be reflected in any of the representations. Um, from a, then switching topics back to open subdiv for a second, the, the, um, the open subdiv um, code base right now you know, represents a lot of, of um, different capabilities and showcases kind of different ways of dealing with subdivision surfaces. But the core of open subdiv is relatively small and simple. It's um, you know, less than 40,000 lines of, of um, portable C++ that doesn't depend on any other libraries. And, and, um, and that supports basically the full feature set that Nick was describing in terms of Catmull Clark and Loop, um, and, but also um, can, can 
it was robust in the face of non-manifold topology and can deal with multiple UV shells and things. And so, um, so the the real motivation for open subdiv was to try to make sure that there was always a consistent way for any DCC or tool to to access this behavior um, in a convenient way. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, happy to deal deal with more questions about open subdiv, but but I think the the idea of introducing subdivision surfaces to get the benefits that Nick was describing does seem attractive um, to consider for um, for the representations. Neil, you were trying to talk. You'll trip it. You're watching my mute button. <laughs> yes, I am. I do my job. <laughs> I was also say hi to, to David. David, we're gonna get we're gonna get subdiv into a kernel standard. I know this is our second run at it, <laughs> but I think this time's this time's the the charm. I think. I mean, I, 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 it's really interesting. The uh, asking the question perhaps a different way. If if GLTF were to adopt uh, op, um, open subdiv, and I, and I think the time is is right, uh, and I, the working group is coming round to doing it. Um, would you want uh, Nick or David, would you want um, GLTF to adopt a subset? Like, a, is there an obvious like runtime subset so we can kind of maintain, you know, the differentiation between USD and GLTF? I mean, in some you know positive way and not overburden the runtime with too much complexity, but you know, still enable kind of the flow through from uh, USD based tools. Or, or would you, or, or would you prefer you now GLTF just to try to do the whole the whole thing, uh, I'm really interested in your kind of perspective on that. Do you have thoughts, David? Um, some some thoughts. I mean, I, th I think that's that's a great question. I mean, I think the, um, the there's certainly a lot a lot of good use cases that don't um, need the full feature set of open subdiv. And as Michael um, was saying, you know if you know, if, if you have a reduced feature set, then maybe you know it becomes even even simpler to to replicate what we need. Um, the 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 flip side of that is the features that we have built into Open Subdiv are are features that we found useful from from a you know a film production standpoint. So we do use um, you know creases and multiple UV shells um, in our, in our production assets. So if we're we're looking forward to to how um, what kinds of assets we want to be able to represent in in our pipelines over time. Then I think we'd want to you know consider like what that roadmap looks like for for how we make sure that we're supporting all of all, all the features that are needed are, are there. But I think that's a that's a discussion that 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 could be had about like wh whether whether it's necessary to take them all at once or 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 whether you would build that out incrementally. Um, but again, like a nice thing about, about at least the core of open subdiv is it does support all those features, um, you know, relatively compactly and robustly uh, in its current form. But um, yeah. Yeah. From the perspective of things being data driven, um, the kinds of annotations that you add to a file in order to support open subdiv um, are much sparser than you might expect. Like an open subdiv surface description is a list of vertices, it's a list of edges, it's a list of um, faces comprised from um, those edges and vertices. There is annotations on the edges and the vertices about how uh, creased they are. Um, and I think there's annotations on faces as to whether a face is a whole in order to be able to calculate boundary conditions um, for like irregular meshes. But uh, beyond that, there's not a lot of extra data that travels along in order to get um, the sort of magical behavior of the algorithm. So it's not clear to me that there's much to be done on the reduction side of things because you wouldn't say, well, I don't want holes or um, I don't want vertex creasing um, because it would probably be way more work to figure out how to deal with not having it um, than it would be to just have it. <laughs> so, so I'm going to um, say that um, while while I mentioned it's possible to have a subset, I would advocate um, GLTF adopting the whole specification. There, I mean, my main, I guess, my main reason for pointing that out is to say, um, as as Nick mentioned, that the services are mathematically described, right? 
the so there's not a dependence on on the library there's a dependence on a specification and there's a free and high quality implementation of that library and i think that's fully uh consistent with with um the principles of gltf and i agree totally with what um david and nick said i mean the the feature set is um you know kind of mature right it's what you need it doesn't have excess that um is burdensome and the whole library as nick mentioned it you know it fits on an iphone uh, without any trouble um so it seems like it's it's time to do that and uh totally agree with what uh what nick said that it's you know it's based on some some really nice math that guarantees um you know uh that you can understand what the level of continuity is um uh, nick didn't mention that for camel clark away from extraordinary points, everything becomes um, piecewise beast points. And then it gets a little funny. At, and so it's it's actually a twice continuously differentiable everywhere except for the extraordinary points where it becomes just uh, once uh, uh, differentiable. And those are a, a very, usually a very small number of points on the entire object. So that's uh, quite different from these sort of ad hoc schemes for, for, uh, for vertex moving. Anyway, you know, this math has been worked out. Um, it's beautiful. It does the job. It's suitable for the very highest end. And the the cost of doing it in terms of either runtime or the total amount of code is perfectly manageable by today's standards. So I, I would say it's it's time to to do it and and time to to take the whole thing. And by the way, I was um uh one of the authors of that paper that you put up with uh, Jerry's game. Oh, nice. <laughs> we can recognize that. Yeah. Disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I that's, uh, appreciate that, Michael. Thank you.